Coming up on Tech News Weekly, is there a link between cell phone use and cancer? We'll check back in on that topic. We check in on the big news from Facebook's F8 conference that just wrapped up. Have autonomous vehicles actually proven their safety yet? And we dive deep on how to choose a VPN. All that more coming up next on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 30, recorded Thursday, May 3rd, 2018. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by LastPass. Join over 13 million LastPass users and start managing and securing your passwords today. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit. And by Hover. Register a domain name with Hover and build your online brand today. Go to hover.com slash twit and save 10% off your first purchase. Welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is a show where we cover all sides of the tech news. The bottom, the top, the sides, the inside, the outside. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. So is it just like a square or is it a cube? Is it a three-dimensional object? It's a three-dimensional object. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. We uh, dive inside, which is what we're going to do right now. A few weeks ago, uh, we interviewed Mark Hurstgard from The Nation magazine on the topic of big wireless and its potential cover-up of cell phone radiation research. We heard from a few of you, including Brian, who wrote, quote, the scientific consensus at this point is that cell phone radio emissions are apparently safe and no evidence uh, has provided a causal or even casual link between non-ionizing radio waves and cancer. Brian asked if we might bring someone onto the show who can speak to the flip side of that discussion. We're happy to do so. He actually recommended today's guest, Christopher Labos, co-host of the Body of Evidence podcast and author of the post titled Cell Phones and Cancer, Random Chance in Clinical Trials over at sciencebasedmedicine.org. Welcome to the show, Chris. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's great to get you on. I'm so happy this, that this worked out. Uh, let's let's kind of begin by taking a look at Brian's assertion, or the, the gentleman who emailed us, uh, that there is no ca casual or causal evidence of such a risk. Prior to the report that was put out in March by the National Toxicology Program, what has research shown as relates to any type of connection between cell phones and cancer? Well, prior to the NTP study actually coming out, the evidence was, I think we would have to say, somewhat inconsistent. You had some positive studies, some negative studies. But you have to understand that in science, let's say that there was no association between cell phones and cancer. You would normally expect to be a you normally expect there to be a little bit of a spread in the data. You'd have a lot of studies showing no major effect, and then you'd have a few outliers one way or the other. So the data has overall been fairly inconsistent, and I think most people who would look at it would say, well, there's no real conclusive evidence that cell phones cause cancer. And that's based on the number of studies that have been done and some fairly large cohort studies that have been done, you'd have to say that if there was a risk, it would probably be very, very small and probably not something that we need to worry about in terms of the public health of the population. So I, I know I was reading through some of your work and, you know, had an interesting piece on organic foods. Um, and, you know, the argument is, oh, you know, for someone to say, well, you know, organic foods are automatically safer for you. And so I don't know if that's true or not, but, you know, I could say, well, I'm going to buy them anyway. And the negative mm -hmm. to that is, well, they're a lot more expensive and maybe you're wasting your money, you could spend your money in another way. But what about people like after I read this evidence, I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to keep my uh, phone in my purse or my backpack. I'm not going to keep it on my pocket. I'm going to tell my kids to keep theirs in their backpacks, not in their pockets. I mean, is there anything wrong with just taking those? Like, I know I'm not saying cell phones cause cancer, but just, just doing like small things like that just in case. No, I mean, I don't think there's any harm to carrying your cell phone in your purse as opposed to your pocket or something like that. Where I think there is a danger is when people start trying to sell you products, because there's a lot of people out there who are trying to sell you devices that will shield 
mm-hmm. um, you know, the uh, the non-ionizing radiation that comes off of your phone. And there, there's a harm because first of all, you have to pay money for this, and you always have to be a little bit skeptical of somebody who tries to tell you that cell phones cause cancer if they then turn around and try to sell you a product to protect you from cancer because you know it's, it's the old joke is that if you create the disease, you can then sell the cure. So. You know, I I don't think there's any particular harm to, you know, like you said, carrying your cell phone in your purse, but you have to be careful about these, you know, what's the next step in that argument? Because obviously we're not gonna start throwing away our cell phones. They become so ingrained into our lives that we can't really operate without them. So the the, the first danger is, I think, like I said, the selling of, of inappropriate products. But the second danger is, is that are you creating anxiety in the population? Are you scaring people into thinking that cell phones cause cancer when in fact, they actually don't. And, you know, there is a harm to the population if we keep putting out these these warnings that are end up not being true, because when there is a real warning that we have to put out there, people are just going to ignore it. And if you want sort of a parallel, what happened in California recently where a drug said that coffee has to can has to have a a cancer warning, um, which is completely at odds with all the scientific evidence. So the more warnings we put out there, the more people are going to start to tune them out. And I think there's a real danger in people being saturated with information that is, you know, frankly, just not entirely true. Yeah, hard to find the the real nuggets through the noise, which I think in this topic is has always been kind of something that I, I you know I even get confused by, and you know my wife and I would have have conversations about this, and it's really hard in this conversation to point to any definitives because there really aren't any, and I think I think we saw a big reaction to the NTP study, which was you know kind of a lot of that reaction both for and against this idea kind of seemed to come back back around to this idea that it was peer reviewed and that during the peer review, certain assertions were elevated to a higher importance after, you know, peers, you know, <laughs> all of these, you know, very, very, um, you know, people who would know the difference between uh, an actual risk and not, they all took a look at this and said, eh, actually, this seems more conclusive than what even the report says. What do you what do you say about that that aspect of this report? Yeah, I mean, well, you have to understand something that scientists are at the end of the day, human beings, and they are prone to the same biases that any person is is liable to. And I'm not talking about biases in in terms of prejudice, I'm talking about biases in terms of how we look at the data. So what was interesting about the NTP study was that, and this was sort of the point that I tried to make in the the, uh, article on science-based medicine that that you mentioned, was that the, the researchers and the people who did the peer review were not interested really in looking at this idea of could this all have been random chance? They were just sort of looking at the raw data and they said, oh, we see an effect. But they weren't looking into the plausibility of that effect. One of the things you would expect with cell phones is that the more you increase the dose of radio frequency radiation, the more cancer you should get. But we didn't actually see that. So that's a little bit counterintuitive. You would expect that the more of the more RFR, the more radio frequency radiation you give to rats, mice, human beings, the more you should have an increased risk for cancer. Well, that wasn't what the NTP report showed. And so you as a person might say, well, that makes me a little bit more skeptical about the results. Whereas the people reviewing the data, they weren't in looking at that aspect of it. What they were essentially doing was looking at the hazard rather than the risk. And to understand what these two terms mean, the analogy that I always use is, imagine you were to come across a bear. A bear poses a hazard to your safety. A bear can cause you a significant amount of harm. But if you were to come across that bear in a zoo behind a cage, that bear is gonna pose very little risk to you. So a hazard represents the theoretical harm that something can cause you, whereas the risk represents the actual harm. And part of the reason the NTP study was done was to look at the potential hazard of cell phones, not necessarily to examine whether they posed a risk to human beings. And so to illustrate that point, the way the NTP study was done was they took these rats, they took these mice, they exposed them to uh, cell phone radiation, over nine hours of cell phone radiation every day for two years. And so, you know, that's not how most people use their cell phones, right? That's not how I use my cell phone. In fact, I talk on my cell phone very little. I'm using it mainly for texting and, and, and you know, uh, surfing on the internet. So, you know, there, whatever the potential hazard to cell phones might be, the risk that it'll pose to human beings the way you and I use our cell phones on a daily basis is probably going to be very minimal. But the peer review wasn't concerned with that distinction. They were looking just at the hazard. And so it's important 
to not accept peer review on blind faith, but to actually understand what was the process going on behind it. Sure. That's really interesting. I mean, that yeah. goes along with the, you know, how dangerous it is really to get in a car um, and, you know, based on the risk versus getting an airplane. And, you know, you you hear right. more about airplane crashes. We're going to actually talk about um, how risky it is to get in a car in a, a later segment. But my, my I have a question about longitudinal studies. I mean, it's impossible right. to have one right now. I mean, you can't say, well, you know, this child um, played with a cell phone from age three until age 23. And this is what happened because they just haven't been around as I guess maybe they've been around that long now. But but what 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 about longitudinal? studies have there been any of those that we can point to, to that lead us either way yeah there have been a few there's been the the danish cohort study that was what they basically did there was they what's very interesting about a lot of these european countries is they have national databases they were able to look at their entire population uh they were able to look at everybody who was diagnosed with a brain tumor over the course of you know 20 25 year span and they were able to look at mobile phone subscriptions uh, because that information was available to them so within that national database they saw that there was in fact no association between uh, having a mobile phone subscription and developing brain cancer. Now, you have to be careful about these type of studies because there's always the possibility of confounding. You can never you know, completely control for all the variables. Maybe the cell phone users and the non-users were different in fundamental ways in terms of you know, what they ate, how much they exercised, stuff like that. But even in these studies that have looked at over 20 years of data, we haven't really seen an association. And also, I mean, I think the most important point, if you're concerned about brain cancer rates, brain cancer rates in you know, both Canada and the US have remained you know, fairly stable over the past 20 years. So we're not seeing this uptick that you would expect to see because while cell phones are a relatively new technology, I mean, they have been around now for about 20 years. So if there was a significant effect, we should be starting to see signs of it now and when we're really not doing that. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's what, absolutely one of the questions that I had as far as that was concerned. Was there anything in this particular report or in any of the reports that you've seen maybe, uh, you know, surrounding uh, this, but maybe supporting the general thesis, the general uh, point of the NTP study that has challenged your own understanding on this? That's made because uh, I mean, it's it's pretty, pretty obvious your your perspective on this is that yeah. at least based on the evidence that we have right now there is no direct no obvious direct correlation but does does any of the data points from this particular report kind of challenge that in any way for you or do you do you feel like it it just all comes down to chance and it really doesn't sway you well, I, I think initially when I first read the report, I said, oh, well, you know, this is something I have to look into because, of course, like most people, I found out about this by watching the news, right? You saw yeah, the right. news reports and I said, OK, well, I better look into this. And I think few people did what I did, which is go in and, you know, read through the 600 page document that the National Toxicology Program put out because I clearly have a lot of free time on my hands. Um, <laughs> But when, you, but when you look at it, one of the things that was interesting was uh, irrespective of the brain cancer link, which was you know only seen in male rats, not in female rats, not in male mice, not in female mice. So I said, okay, well, that's probably a chance finding. I was prepared to write that off. Um, but there was somewhat more evidence for this uh, idea of cardiac schwannomas, these nerve tumor cells found in the heart. And people said, well, because these tumors are histologically similar to acoustic neuromas, that you would see in the brain, maybe this is supportive evidence for this particular type of tumor in the brain. And I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. Let me take a look at that. Uh, but then I actually went in and looked at the data. And what I found was, yes, there were more cardiac schwannomas, so more of this type of tumor in the heart. But when you looked at throughout the entire body, because these types of nerve tumors can occur anywhere there are nerves, and these nerves are throughout the body. So within the heart, there were more tumors in the rats exposed to cell phones. But when you looked at the total number of tumors throughout the whole body, there wasn't a difference. In fact, there was no association when you looked at the total number of schwannomas. So, you know, when I actually dug into the data, I was said, okay, well, this isn't actually as compelling as I initially thought it was. And, and this is how the scientific process is supposed to work. We get the data, we sift through it, we argue, we debate, we move forward. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually science is going to come to a consensus and you know so far at a certain point if nobody can prove that cell phones are dangerous to some side some type of, of compelling evidence eventually we're going to have to assume that there's probably no effect there because the the thing that most people don't really understand with science is that you can't prove a negative mm -hmm. i can never prove to you that reindeer can't fly even if i took a reindeer to the top of a very tall building and threw him off the building and watched him crash to the ground I haven't proved that reindeer can't fly. I've only proved that that particular reindeer couldn't fly on that particular day. 
So you'll never be able to prove that cell phones are safe because that's not theoretically possible. You just have to look at all the studies that eventually get done and say, well, if nobody's able to show a conclusive link, we eventually declare that the risk is either non-existent or so small that we can't measure and that it's not something that we need to worry about as a population. So that's sort of how I've been sort of looking at the data on this subject. Hmm. So we know that people have died when they've been texting and driving and gotten in a car accident. Yeah. Um, we know that the more time kids spend on screens, the less time they're outside. Uh, they, you know, the 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 weight, uh, you know, obesity rates in children are going up could be related. Why don't I mean? Why is there so much more news about the whenever there's a, a cell phones cause cancer? Why is there so much more news about that rather than things that we can more easily prove? Well, and I think you've raised some two excellent points. There are some very real harms to cell phones. It's not cancer. It's the fact that if you're texting while you're driving, you're going to get into a car crash. And there are thousands of, of car crashes due to distracted driving every year. And, you know, the whole obesity epidemic, we need kids to be outside playing, not sitting home and playing on their phones and playing on their tablets. Those are two very excellent points. But we don't talk about those risks because those are risks that we feel we can control. Human beings are surprisingly bad at gauging risks. And I guess you're gonna get into this when you talk about you know planes and how dangerous they actually are, or, or cars and how dangerous it is to actually drive. People are much more afraid to get into a plane than they are to get into a car, even though getting into a car is a you know, potentially very dangerous thing because we have a lot of car crashes annually. And it's because we feel that we can control that. So because we feel that we can control, you know, whether we're texting and driving, because we feel that we can control, you know, how much our kids are outside playing, we don't seem to see that as a threat. But because we can't control brain cancer, because it's something that seems to be outside of our grasp, it's something we have a lot more difficulty wrapping our heads around and it tends to scare us more. And that's why I think we tend to talk about these issues more instead of talking about some of the really important issues, which is, you know, I think distracted driving is a very important issue and it's something we need to take a lot more seriously. And it's something we don't talk about because, again, it gets back to the fact that we feel that we can control it. So happy to bring you on. Chris Lavos, um, I feel like I've learned a lot more about this um, with you on the show, and that's that's what I was hoping for. So thank you for um, for joining us and kind of shedding light on this perspective. You have a podcast, Body of Evidence. I mentioned it at the beginning of the interview. That can be found at bodyofevidence.ca. Uh, anything else you want to point people to, maybe your Twitter handle or anything online where people can follow you? Oh, yeah. So you can either come to the website or you can follow me on Twitter. It's at Dr. Labos, D-R-L-A-B-O-S, uh, either of those two things. And uh, yeah, come check out the podcast. We tend to tackle topics like this every day and we look at the evidence behind all these uh, you know, uh, various topics. So come, uh, come check us out. Fantastic. Chris, thanks again for joining us and best of luck. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take care. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Uh, by the way, before we get into our next interview, a big thanks to Joe Gregory who sent us this tweet of how he listens to Tech News Weekly while spreading oil in road construction. As you can see here with this awesome video of him doing just that. Uh, we can only assume that Tech News Weekly is playing in the, in the cab uh, while he's doing that. We'll trust you. And it could also be the TNT network because it just said TNT. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> no, that's true. Hmm. I, just, watching I just searched TV for the hashtag because you guys didn't send us any of your selfies this week. So send us your selfies, please. <laughs> please do. TNW, twit.tv. <laughs> Judging from my Twitter stream this week, Facebook's annual developers conference F8 is just as flashy as it's always been with cute canine Instagram stars and so-called innovations that are really often just copies of other popular websites and apps. Not only was Mark Zuckerberg not evasive and contrite as he'd been at the congressional hearings last month, he actually joked about those hearings. As Molly McHugh from The Ringer says, Facebook's apology tour is officially over. Welcome to the show, Molly. Hey, guys. How are you? Good. So you attended some F8 sessions. Uh, was anyone talking about how the company is possibly destroying our entire democracy? <laughs> well, I would say off stage, there was a lot of talk about that, and they definitely acknowledged it more than anyone thought they would, I think. Um, at the same time, it was very clear this was a different audience than Congress. Um, Mark Zuckerberg had a lot more liberties he could take, and it felt kind of like, uh, we're done being in timeout, and this is how we're coming out of that process. So, so you write that he was kind of full of sw swagger. Like, was I mean, was the was there clapping? Like, was there was everyone drinking the Kool Aid? Um, I mean, mostly I saw pictures of yeah. the cute little Instagram dog, which was cute, but very cute. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, it was kind of. I would say the reception felt like any other F8. There was lots of clapping. Everybody would 
you know, give a woohoo if something happened. Everybody laughed a lot when he made jokes. Um, it's a very warm crowd, and a lot of them are people who also work at Facebook, so that makes sense too. Um, I'd say like behind the scenes, developers certainly have some concerns about what's going to be going on and how it will affect them. Um, but as far as the keynote went, it definitely felt like they had a really warm audience. So it was a little bit strange. Um, and at the same time, uh, while the reaction was, you know, very enthusiastic, I would say that the announcements all felt very subdued and it was a little bit pulled back as far as what they talked about. Yeah, it really did seem like there were, it, I mean, obviously it's top of mind. This is probably the biggest, you know, moment for Facebook since, since it was created as far as public scrutiny. And that, and that was kind of my bit, my big question from being at F8 kind of around this idea that maybe, you know, the people who are reporting on this, the press and, you know, the people in technology are way more worked up about the privacy uh, implications of this than just, you know, de even developers, but just regular users. Was that a good, was that a good place to kind of get, get that sense to see if everyone else really feels that concerned about the privacy issues as we tend to, because we talk yeah. about it all the time? <laughs> I mean, we're definitely more cognizant of them and understand the scope of it a little bit better. Um, when I talk to friends and family about this, they kind of brush it off. And, and, um, I also think I don't live in the Bay area. So when, I think being removed from that climate also people are even more pulled back so when i came here i was a little like oh we're all talking about this so much that's so crazy um so there's definitely more front of mind here and i will say that anytime i talked to like a pr person or anybody affiliated with facebook everyone acknowledged what was going on you know like they're like yeah, this year's been crazier and obviously right. why like you know congress was a big deal so that's different. They, I think they feel that they actually had to talk about it this year, um, while at the same time knowing full well that for most users, it's a non-issue. This crowd cares. Um, most users are ready to get past it. Hmm. So Facebook was supposed to release a hardware device at the end, what do you, at, the, at this event, but, they, but we didn't hear about that. What do you know about this device? Um, so we were looking at, it was going to be a, a smart home speaker, but, you know, like an Echo or a Google Home, and that would have been a huge announcement. Facebook does not do hardware, as we know. Um, they obviously have the Oculus Rift Go, but that's a little bit different, and it's, you know, not something totally Facebook made. Um, I, I felt like the last time I really thought about Facebook hardware was way back with the Facebook phone, which is so long ago now, and it was such a weird announcement. Um, this would have been huge. I don't think they could do it. They couldn't make a big flashy, uh, you know, big flashy announcement right after you're in front of Congress for privacy implications. Um, there have been issues with what Alexa knows about people. Um, I don't think it's the time for Facebook to enter our homes in a hardware sense, and they knew it as well as everyone else knew it. So that I think it's probably still on the horizon. I, I don't think they've scrapped plans entirely for it. That's just my gut telling me that that's too much intent that's too much of an investment and there's too much possibility for what it can do um, but yeah this would have been a really it would have been bad timing to go in front of congress and have to talk about what your ads know about people and what you know about people and how you're tracking people and then put a device in their homes that essentially could do that even more <laughs> everything we told you about in congress about how how we really know you really well we've now put it into this product <laughs> that you could have in your living room it's going to be awesome yeah it's yeah. Prob probably a really bad time for that uh what about uh but i mean kind of along those lines is this whole dating aspect <laughs> of the service right it, it creates right. a separate profile so it's not necessarily a profile that your friends see but like what i couldn't figure out is is it pulling in is it making these matches based partially on your profile information that it already does know about you? Like all of that expanded information. And if so, are people going to get worked up about that? What did, what did you think about that product? I, it like probably is the biggest, one of the biggest announcements they made actually. And it felt like it was kind of like slid in there. Like, and by the way, we're doing dating. Yeah. Okay. Goodbye. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a big deal. Um, there's definitely when they were talking about, so the way it'll work is, you won't swipe like you would in Tinder or Hinge, but you will enter yourself into this dating pool and then you will see events. And when you unlock an event, everyone can see you're going. And I, I think the assumption is then you take this into the real world. Um, that scares me a little bit that you would have like a list of everyone going to an event. It seems like there should be a way to hide that information from some people. It just makes me a little bit nervous. You know, and I know it's a public place and it's a public event, but it just seems like there could be some problems with that. 
Um, I'm very anxious to hear what sort of privacy restrictions there will be in dating because they really didn't talk about it very much. Um, but that's kind of a big deal. Honestly, we were kind of all joking when they announced it that like Facebook has so much data on us. At this point, could they just comb the service and be like, here, here is the person you should be dating. We know this, you know, I mean, they're just like doing this because it's what we're comfortable with. And in the back of their minds, they already, they're like, eh, they're going to, this would have been the best match, but we can't do that because it's creepy or something. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I think that it will be taking information about us and trying to, um, it will, maybe those people will be at the top of the list when you unlock an event. Um, right. That's certainly, you know, when you find my friends feature, there's lots that goes into promoting certain people to you. I, I don't know why that wouldn't be used for Facebook dating. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And what about the clear history feature? What did you think of that? Uh, I think that's, I was really excited about that. It was, again, like a little like, oh, there's this tiny thing we added. And they definitely said it this way where they're just like, if you choose to clear your history, uh, Facebook won't work as well because it won't know you as well and you might not get ads you like, but we decided you're ready for this, <laughs> you know? Like, we, we can make the decision now. So it felt a little bit um, placating in that way when they announced it. It's like, we, we have, most of us know, especially everyone in this audience knows how cookies work and, and knows how tracking and ad preferences work. So yes, I think we're ready for the responsibility. Um, but it, it's a great tool. I hope that it's um, really promoted to the people who might not know about it. Like everyone in that audience are people who would probably already be able to find that and use it. I'm hoping that like, my parents and um, college kids are going to have, it's going to be very elevated, very visible, and people will start using it. Mm -hmm. You can remember, imagine saying, back in my day, we didn't have clear history. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a lot was made of uh, Isabel Clown Clownman. She's a, she was, she's a, a data scientist at Facebook and she happens to be seven months pregnant, seven months pregnant. She spoke about, uh, AI and ethics at Facebook. Um, and somebody on Twitter said, Oh great. Now Facebook is using a pregnant woman as a shield, which I <laughs> was hilarious. Uh, but what did you think about what she, what she said? Do you feel like it gave a good idea of how like Facebook employees, especially the data scientists really do, uh, care about ethics? I thought her talk was fascinating, actually. I was really glad they brought her out. I definitely think some of the motivations behind talking about ethics in such a prominent way this year um, came from the fact that they've had a problem uh, publicly with their ethics. And so I, I think it was a very uh, measured decision to bring her out. Um, that said, how algorithms can be prejudiced and how the, that prejudice can seep into the way we interact in the digital and then in the real world um, is kind of terrifying. So I, I think, you know, Facebook's motivation is, look, we actually care about this and we're trying to figure it out. Um, at the same time, I am glad that she came out there and talked about it. It's definitely a much different kind of keynote, day, a day two keynote than Facebook gives. Usually they're talking about um, how they're going to put computers in our brains and how we'll think out what we upload to the internet and their giant drones and everything. And this time it was more like, we're trying to build an internet that isn't evil or like a VR world and an AI that isn't evil. And it's like, oh, okay, we're going to step back a little bit and talk about that. So I, I liked it, but I totally see why it was a topic. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and you, you mentioned uh, in your write-up on, on this particular point something that I actually hadn't really, I mean, maybe I heard about it, but it ju just wasn't top of mind, the fairness flow tool and how that's now yeah. being integrated into all their products. Explain that a little bit and kind of what, you know, why Facebook is, is using this tool called Fairness Flow. Yeah, well, it's basically a tool that they created to make sure that their jobs recommendations weren't, um, you know, picking certain people. It wasn't only men. They wanted to make sure they had more diversity in who they were looking to hire and who they were building this team with. Because as she pointed out, you need a very diverse uh, arena of people when you're building an AI in order to try and combat bias. And so they wanted to make sure they weren't doing it, too. Um, and that was called Fairness Flow. And it went through these series of questions after questions after questions that you could see if you were including any bias in what you were doing. Um, that started with the jobs, and now it's become a tool that they've made. It's accessible to FB Learner, so that any engineer working on any project at Facebook can apply that to their to their project and 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 try and eliminate any prejudice that they've you know unknowingly entered into it. Hmm. 
Well, Molly, thank you so much for joining us, taking some time out of the F8 conference to talk to us. Molly McHugh is articles editor at The Ringer, which if you haven't checked out, check it out. It has great tech and culture content and some sports content if you're into that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, and she is I am Molly McHugh on Twitter. Thanks so much for coming thank on. Thank you, Molly. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. We appreciate Take it. We'll talk to you soon. After the break, we often say that, of course, self-driving cars will be safer than human driving cars. But how do we know that this is true? And how do we find the best VPN? But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by LastPass. LastPass keeps your passwords organized and secure and right at your fingertips. I've used LastPass for years because there are just too many passwords to remember. I use it for personal stuff and for my work accounts, and I don't have to think about creating a million different secure passwords or remembering any of them. I just remember one. All I have is one. I'm not gonna tell you what it is. It's my master password. It's locked deep inside my brain and you can't get it out. And LastPass remembers all the rest of the passwords. If you're reusing the same password over and over, stop that. Stop it right now. Use LastPass to generate and store strong, unique passwords to keep you safe and secure. LastPass automatically remembers and fills your passwords in anytime, anywhere, whether you're on your computer or on a mobile device. Explore your LastPass vaults where you can easily add, view, and manage items that you've saved. LastPass for Enterprise is great if you are in charge of IT at your business. Get everyone on LastPass Enterprise. They will simplify password management for companies of any size with the tools you need to secure your business while centralizing control of employee passwords and apps. I don't know if you knew this, but over 81% of breaches are caused by weak passwords. LastPass protects every password in your business without slowing down your employees. LastPass makes password sharing convenient for employees while keeping access to corporate data secure. Sensitive data is encrypted at the device level with AES-256 to protect from those pesky man in the middle attacks. As I've said, I've used LastPass, I love it. I've used it on my iPhone, I've used it when I take Jason's uh, Android phone. It works great on all the devices, my iPad. Give me my Android phone back. <laughs> I know, I, uh, I don't use his account. I use my <laughs> own account. I don't know what his password is. He has one secret password too and he'll never tell me it's locked in his brain. LastPass also has other products besides Enterprise besides Enterprise for Business. They also have LastPass Premium, that's for personal use. LastPass Families, that's for your entire family. And LastPass Teams, that's for teams of 50 or less. At work and at home, fix your password woes with LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit today. That's lastpass.com slash T-W-I-T and see which product is right for you. I am not shy about my support for self-driving cars. And for the past few years, I've just been saying, oh, despite setbacks, they're gonna be safer than human drivers. Obviously robots are better and safer than humans. But Sam Abu Al-Samid writes in Forbes, we haven't proven that to be true yet. Welcome back to the show, Sam. Hey, Megan and Jason, how are you doing? Awesome. <laughs> I'm doing good. There's a car behind you, did you know that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> and you're in a that's, showroom. Uh, that's that's Waymo. That's Waymo's uh, next generation car uh, that they announced in uh, in April or end of March. Uh, they're, after they're uh, they're built right now, they're building a fleet of Chrysler Pacificas that drive themselves. And next up is going to be a fleet of Jaguar I Paces. Oh. So I, I personally, I think this should be Leo's next car to replace uh, the the Model X. Okay, Very well, might be if Waymo actually sells their their cars at all. <laughs> well, so. it. It, it won't be it won't be a Waymo car that he gets, but uh, just the the regular I pace should be uh, Leo's yeah. next car. Yeah. Got it. All right. So you say that in the past couple of years, more than thirty seven thousand people have died annually on American roads. That every year thirty seven thousand people, and globally that number goes up to one point two million every year. Um, but when we compare that to how many people have died uh, in a self-driving car, it doesn't really make sense. Can you give us a little bit of context around those numbers? Yeah. So, um, as you said, uh, roughly about 37,000, 37,500 the last couple of years uh, in the U.S., uh, a little more than 1.2 million globally. Um, but you know that that sound, it, it is a lot of people. It's a lot of people to die, but it's also – Driving and, and using the roads is an activity that a lot of people do every single day. Uh, last several years, we've driven, uh, we've had about five or 3.2 trillion vehicle miles traveled just in the United States. 
And if you look at the um, the fatality rate, uh, it's about 1.15 or so fatalities for every 100 million miles that we drive, which when you put it in that context is actually not that bad. Uh, by comparison, back in 1975, when we were just getting started with doing, uh, you know, really improving the safety of vehicles, uh, at that point, we had about 45,000 people dying annually, and we were only driving 1.3 trillion miles a year. So, you know, we had a rate that was closer to six fatalities for every 100 million miles of driving. So, you know, this um, we've dramatically improved without ha without resorting to uh, technologies like um, like autonomous driving, uh, just by doing things like getting people to wear seatbelts, cracking down on drunk driving, improving the the safety of vehicles, and adding active safety systems. So in that context, if we start to look at the little bit of data that we have on autonomous vehicles so far, which isn't very much because most of the companies are keeping whatever data they have very much to themselves. About the, about the only public data that there is uh, are the numbers that are submitted by the companies that are testing in California to, uh, to the California DMV, uh, which amounts to uh, the, the disengagement reports. How often do the human safety drivers have to take over from the autonomous systems? And that's really not a very good metric. Um, you know, and the best one we've got from that is Waymo, who, uh, you know, in their 2017 report, you know, they had the human safety drivers had to take over about every once every 5,600 miles. Uh, by comparison, uh, you know, if you look at all traffic accidents in the United States in 2015, we had about 6.3 million crashes. And that's that amounts to about one crash every almost 500,000 miles. And if every one of those disengagements led to a crash, if the human didn't take over, then um, you know that would be about a hundred times worse than uh, human drivers. So, you know, at this point, we we just don't know. I you know, as an engineer, I'm confident that in the long run, autonomous cars will probably be safer than human drivers. But you know, we shouldn't be rushing into this because at this point, the little bit of evidence we have actually indicates that they're probably a lot worse still at this stage. And what about uh, automated? Uh, well, with automated systems, you know, you can actually test things in a virtual sense. And in real life, we have to test it on real world uh, situations. With these automated vehicles, not only do they do that, but they're also testing in these kind of virtualized um, tests. How how might that influence the numbers that that we're seeing here, as far as like potential, you know, rates of of uh, accidents and crashes? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, clearly, simulation is a big part of proving uh, how safe these vehicles are. And it, it's going to be key to, to really validating how well they can work in a wide variety of conditions. But it, again, there, we have no data. Nobody is talking. You know, Waymo has right. talked about, you know, billions of miles of simulated miles they've tested and other manufacturers are doing the same thing. But nobody's saying, you know, what's actually happening in those simulations. So, you know, as I said, it's probably going to get better. But even in a simulation, you know, from my own experience, a simulation is only as good as the data you give it. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's always going to be situations that you can't anticipate and you won't have set up in a simulation. You can run the same tests over and over again to verify that you've made improvements. But we don't know how good the systems are doing in simulation. So as an engineer, you worked on electronic safety control systems for not self-driving mm -hmm. cars. Is there, I mean, is it of your opinion that maybe just those could get better and we would, it would take longer to actually transition to self-driving cars? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's certainly still room for improvement with existing active safety systems. And in fact, um, you know, one of the things that came out yesterday um, is, you know, for the past year or so, Tesla has been touting the fact that when the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration released their report um, on the Josh Brown crash in 2016, the, the, the first crash with autopilot that killed the, killed the driver, uh, in that report, um, NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, said that car, you know, after um, Tesla vehicles started to be equipped with autopilot, the number of crashes that led to airbag deployments dropped by 40%. And, uh, you know, Tesla has been touting that number ever since, but the, nobody's ever given the data that actually backs that up. And what they, what uh, NHTSA actually released yesterday was a statement saying, 
you know, Tesla probably shouldn't be saying this number because all we did was look at, you know, before and after this date, you know, how many airbag deployments were just to see if if the system got worse. We didn't actually do any evaluation of the effectiveness of, of autopilot itself. And other data that we have from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety indicates that, um, you know, you can actually get about a 40 percent improvement just from doing um, – automatic emergency braking system. So having a camera and radar on the front of the vehicle to look at the distance to the car ahead of you and you know, automatically applying the brakes if the driver doesn't. That alone can reduce rear end collisions by 40%. And that's actually probably where the 40% number really came from and had nothing to do with the auto steer system that's part of autopilot. Tesla has said, it's all, oh, it's all because of uh, auto steer. But in fact, there's no data to back that up. Uh, we're talking a little bit about obviously Tesla and it's, it's hard to talk about Tesla right at this moment in time and not talk about the earnings call and, uh, kind of some of the news that, that came out of that over the last couple of days. Uh, Elon Musk, uh, said a lot of very interesting things on this earnings calls. So I'm, I'm curious to get your take on it, but one of the things that he, he mentioned during the calls that he, he puts the blame, uh, of, kind of these autopilot related accidents on the complacency he's placing that blame at least based on his statements on uh, Tesla's customers for being complacent while they're driving or or you know maybe they understand the technology but they just kind of stop caring and stop being focused on that people get comfortable with the idea that things are automated they drop their guard apparently um do you think that was a fair assessment on Elon Musk's part it kind of seems to shift the responsibility onto the user onto the driver I mean, to to a degree, you know, ultimately, yes, it, it comes down to the driver. The driver is ultimately responsible for controlling the vehicle. Right. You know, as long as we're not in fully autonomous vehicles, ultimately, whoever's behind the wheel is responsible for whatever happens. That said, you know, Tesla has done very little to um, dissuade their customers from touting the, the benefits of autopilot and how it's such a miraculous system. And, you know, Elon himself, you know, standing on stage, you know, at, during presentations talks about how this is, you know, with software updates, this is going to get to full self-driving, you know, and they, they have certainly created the impression that autopilot is far more capable than it is. And, you know, Tesla is, you know, autopilot is by far the, uh, the best known of these systems, but but the the same thing applies to similar systems from other companies, including um, Mercedes Benz and Volvo and BMW um, and and even GM. Um, you know the GM system, uh, Super Cruise, is I would say is actually right now the best of all of these systems. And in fact, I'll be on uh, new screensavers in a couple of weeks with Leo with a, a Cadillac with Super Cruise, and we'll be we'll be demoing that system, but. Um, you know, all of these systems, the manufacturers really need to make it much more clear to drivers. They need to be more uh, frank with drivers, you know, of what these systems really are, uh, that they're driver assist systems, that they are responsible. Um, and, you know, personally, I'm increasingly of the opinion that perhaps we shouldn't even be deploying these kinds of systems because it, it's, you know, the having humans as supervisors for partially automated systems like this is a is just an, it's never going to work um humans are terrible supervisors for machines and we do get complacent and we need to realize that i mean you know it's one thing for elon to place the blame on his customers for these crashes but you know he also needs to realize that okay you know recognize that yeah, humans are going to uh, misuse technology we that's what we do we we do it with with all the technology we have. And if if we're going to misuse and abuse the technology, then we need to make sure that the technology we put out there um, has limits on it that can m mitigate any um, bad consequences from misuse. So, so what about this conference call? Um, Elon Musk said, called some of the questions bonehead and boring, um, and Wall Street did not look kindly on it. Um, they, they were not uh, fans. The stock is not doing great right now. Um, and you also uh, said that Elon's personal finances are, are threatening to Tesla's stock price. Can you t tell us about that? Yeah, um, I mean, this is actually something that was reported um, but two, almost two years ago uh, by my friend Mike Ramsey when he was still writing for the Wall Street Journal. Um, one of the things to, that doesn't get talked about very much, you know, over the last uh, eight years, seven years, um, Tesla has gone back to the stock market since they IPO'd 
uh, I think seven or eight times now, and they've raised up between stocks, stock sales, and um, bond offerings. They've raised about eleven billion dollars in, in additional capital in order to to keep funding the company. And every time they do that, especially when when they sell the stocks, um, because Elon doesn't want to give up control of the company, he's he owns about twenty two percent stakes in both uh, Tesla and SpaceX. Um, because he doesn't want to relinquish control of the company, in order to keep from having his share diluted, he has to – every time the company sells shares to the public, he has to buy a bunch. But because most of his wealth is tied up in those, sh- in those shares of the two companies, um, he doesn't have the cash at hand to do that. So he, you know, he's done what a lot of uh, executives do is he borrows you know, against the, his, his stock, his equity in the company, uh, which is fairly normal. Uh, although he's done it to a much greater degree than I think than just about any other CEO I'm aware of. Uh, and he's he's borrowed close to eight hundred million dollars over the last several years from investment banks uh, in order to buy up a chunk of those shares every time uh, to keep to maintain his twenty two twenty three percent shareholding in the company. And you know as uh, if Tesla's stock drops too much, then what happens is he could, you know, he could get a margin call on that, and the the bank could say, okay, you know, you you put up your shares as collateral. They don't have enough value at this point because of the price of the shares. So we need you to pay back the money. And so at that point, he has the option of either selling his shares to pay it back or handing over those shares to the banks, and they sell it off. Um, and if that happens, and we, you know, because these are all private um, a, you know, agree- loan agreements between him and his bankers. We don't know, you know what the thresholds are, uh, but based on other similar things, it's, it's probably somewhere uh, in the low $200 range. And if that happens, if he, if he ends up having to turn over his shares or sell them to pay off his loans, then that could uh, lead to a cascading effect of collapsing the share price altogether. So he has to be really careful to to keep the share price up, um, you know, in order to keep the whole company from collapsing. Well, Sam, thank you so much. As always, Sam Abu Al Samad is a senior analyst um, and is on the transportation efficiency team at Navigant Research and co-host of the Wheel Bearings podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for having me on again. Always great to have you. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Up next, we dive deep on VPNs. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Hover. Building your online brand has never been more apparent, uh, important. Uh, and your online identity, as you know, begins with your domain name. Domain name, your passion, whatever it may be. Buying a domain name is the first and biggest step to building your personal brand online. Your domain name tells the online community who you are and what you're passionate about. Web hosts and websites evolve as their brand, their website, and hosting needs change. And keeping your domain separate from hosting gives you the flexibility to choose the right platform for your business. No one wants to be stuck with a solution that doesn't meet their needs. Hover offers the best-in-class customer support team, no upsells. Hover Connect actually allows you to connect your domain name to many website builders with just a few simple clicks. There's personalized email that matches your domain further, supporting your online identity that's really nice to have. Free who is privacy. Hover has over 400 domain extensions to choose from. You can get lost looking at all those extensions to find just the right one, including all the basics, of course, and then fun niche uh, extensions in there as well. Go to hover.com slash twit and you'll get 10% off your first purchase. That's hover.com slash twit. And we thank Hover for their support of Tech News Weekly. There are a number of reasons why someone might wish to use a VPN service, but the biggest reason is because users want to increase their security and their privacy online. Let's face it, now more than ever, even non-techies have somewhat of an understanding that keeping a low profile online might actually have value. Usually that conversation includes picking a virtual private network to funnel their internet through. And joining us to talk about his exhaustive four-month research into 32 VPN services is Mark Smyrniotis from Wirecutter. Welcome to the show, Mark. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. It's great to get you here today. Uh, So first of all, what makes a VPN such a powerful way to increase uh, somebody's privacy online. How how do you think it kind of compares to some of the other security and privacy methods uh, from a broader sense? I, I definitely think it's one tool of many. Um, one of the reasons this is such a huge piece that we published is um, 
when we really started working into it, we found there are a lot of instances where using a VPN can really up your your security. When you start talking about privacy, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. There are times when um, a VPN can help, and there are times when uh, other tools, browser extensions, um, and ad blockers can be a little bit more effective for, like you said, kind of staying under the radar. Um, you know, you were talking about Facebook earlier on the show, um, how we control what we're sharing on Google and Facebook and what those marketing profiles are collecting. Um, that goes a really far away too. And I would say people need to have a good understanding of uh, what other information is out there, what they're letting out there before they jump to a VPN as a silver bullet. Um, it, it's, it's one tool of many, to be sure. Yeah, and situational as well, because there are some scenarios that are that make a lot of sense for VPN, like a public Wi-Fi, for for instance. Like we we've heard it time and time again that you go to a public Wi-Fi, you don't connect with a VPN. I mean, there might be someone there that's picking up on your uh, on your connection. You know, can actually access your machine as a result. Uh, you know, of of whatever protections you do or do not have in place. Um, what are some of the other kind of scenarios in which VPN is most useful? So th that's a huge one. That's the one where when we talk to different experts, we actually found some consensus um, that on public Wi-Fi, even if it's a secured network, um, a VPN is really useful and really worthwhile. Um, so 100%, so that would be the best use. Um, when you start moving up kind of, a, you know, security experts talk about threat modeling. When you start moving up the pyramid, um, the next thing you might think about is websites tracking you. And, um, you know, a, a VPN will change the IP address that they're going to see when you visit Google or Facebook or, or Wirecutter or anyone else. Um, and so that provides a little bit of a, a privacy shield. But again, when you're talking about online tracking, most of what we're giving up is coming from um, tracking that has nothing to do with your IP address. Um, so it's a little murky if that's really your best course. Mm -hmm. The next la layer above that would be um, people thinking about ISPs and how much is your ISP logging and tracking about you? Um, I mean, the answer is they they can track pretty much anything they want to. Um, broad terms of service generally allow them to. Um, in 2013, there was a really good example of uh, AT&T actually started offering uh, Customers, they could pay an extra thirty dollars to opt out of targeted ads based on uh, internet activity, and it was a short-lived kind of pilot program. Um, there isn't a ton of evidence right now that any ISP in the U.S. has a huge log of every website you've ever visited, um, though. I think there's probably an argument to be made if if they could make money off of that down the line, they probably would. Um, but a, a VPN can protect that data, can protect what websites you're visiting, um, because all they're going to see is just encrypted traffic flowing back and forth. Um, then the big one, the big one that everyone wants to focus on is always government surveillance. And uh, ever since the Snowden revelations, that's what people always want to uh, use, run to a VPN for, is all my traffic being sucked up by some government agency. Um we talked to uh, a couple different experts. One of the ones we talked to is an analyst at the EFF, Amul Kalia, um, and talking to him about what exactly is going on in government surveillance, what we don't know and what we don't know. You know, uh, these high encryption standards are still considered pretty secure. Sometimes there are vulnerabilities kind of found around the edges. Um, there's some information to suggest that encrypted traffic gets logged and held for later uh, by a government agency that scoops it up and, and they hope they can decrypt it later. But the thing we really realized, even though everyone wants to put their tinfoil hat on about government surveillance, there's all this low hanging fruit, all these you know privacy threats and security threats that um, are more immediate and easier to protect against than government surveillance. So uh, I mean, I went down this rabbit hole. I, I read lots of articles and, and and we were doing all this research and all these interviews, and and I could certainly get paranoid about it as well. But ultimately, we felt, look, that's that's not the number one thing people should be worried about uh, when they're looking at whether or not to use a VPN. Um, it's just not the it's just not the best tool. There's so much else uh, you'd have to protect to really make it worth it if if you're worried about that real high level mm -hmm. uh, tracking. 
I'm mostly worried um, when I'm traveling and I use public Wi-Fi, like you said, but I'm mostly on my iPhone. You didn't cover any iOS uh, VPNs. Um, why was that? Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a little uh, hitch in iOS VPN usage right now. Um, OpenVPN is the protocol that um, kind of all of our experts felt was uh, the most secure and uh, widely used. It was the one to kind of fall back to for the protocol that's initiating all these all these secure connections. Um, OpenVPN is released by OpenVPN Inc. Uh, under a general public use license. And there's a, a little hiccup in that um, that GPL license isn't allowed to be incorporated into apps on the App Store. Um, that means that iOS apps right now are using alternative protocols. Some of them are pretty outdated and not very secure. Some of them um, are considered more secure and more recent, but you might have some compatibility issues on certain networks. So right now we're recommending that um, anyone that has an iOS device, you can use the OpenVPN Connect app. Uh, it's just a free third-party application from the, the same group that put together the protocol. And then you can load any profile for pretty much any major VPN provider onto it. Um, unfortunately, it's not a great app. Uh, it's not nearly as good as the native apps on uh, on Mac or Windows or an Android phone. But it is really the most secure and reliable way right now to get an open VPN connection on an iOS device. And then what about just in general? You you made a couple of like top level picks. Uh, one one for kind of like the the best VPN service based on the ones you tested, and then one for your budget pick. I mean, you looked at a lot of services here. Thirty two VPN services. What what do you recommend? Uh, and that was the tip of the iceberg. So yeah. the one that came out on top was um, iVPN. Um, of all the things we consider, there's a lot of you know technical features to to start listing off in giant spreadsheets, and we did that. Um, but one of the big things that gets its own section in this guide is trust. Um, you're handing over potentially a lot of data to a VPN provider. Um, and so we kind of started our list with, okay, what major what major providers is everyone talking about? User reviews, other trusted outlets, what what names keep popping up again and again? Um, and then we started looking uh, in part, uh, thanks to the help of the New York Times information security team, we started looking at what our base level of technology was going to be, what kind of encryption did we want, what kind of protocols. And then we did uh, speed testing on all of them, over 300 some uh, speed tests in total uh, across all different servers around the world. Um, and then we started talking to each company about how they operate um, and about who was behind them. And what we liked about IVPN um, uh, when I was sending questions back and forth with the CEO, Nick Pastel, um, he's a public guy. There's interviews uh, uh, with him at, at other outlets. Um, much of their, it, it's not a huge company, but much of their senior staff is listed on their website. And he was really forward with us about, look, this is um, how we go about uh, keeping our internal system secure. This is um, what we do to prevent logs from accidentally ending up on a server. Um, and he really was able to answer all the questions that made us go, okay, this is not um, you know, some anonymous person uh, sitting in their basement collecting all your data. Um, once we got over that hurdle of trust, uh, iVPN, we really like the apps. They're really easy to use. Even if you've never used a VPN before, the default settings are good enough. You can kind of just mash the button and, and you'll be in pretty good shape. Um, and all the connections that we were testing, uh, they have, I think it was 22 servers around the world, server locations around the world. And all the connections we tested were were really good. They were reliable broadband speeds, um, as opposed to sometimes we would hit a certain location with a certain service and it, you'd be like on dial up again. Um, and regardless of how much you trust a service, if it can't perform, it can't perform. Um, so, you know, IVPN had the performance, it had the applications, it, it really had the trust that we were looking for. Um, and we also wanted one where people could come in and, and not be intimidated by it. And I, I like how clear and simple their support section is. It's something that's not common in all the, the VPN provider um, support sections. They have simple tutorials. If, if you don't understand uh, a lot of the jargony terminology, you'll still be able to use the, 
the extra settings and you'll be able to customize it a little bit without getting too lost. Um, so that ultimately was the top pick, but it, it's not, it's not cheap. It's a hundred dollars a year. Um, and VPN services go on sale a lot. And so it feels like compared to ones you see advertised all the time, that m- might be a little bit much. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, like you said, we made a budget pick as well. And our budget pick ended up being tour guard. Um, Again, you know, we kind of got over that trust hurdle talking to CEO and looking at what they've talked about publicly and and the kind of groups that they support publicly, privacy advocacy. Um, TorGuard defaults to 128-bit AES encryption, whereas uh, IVPN defaults to 256. Um, And we decided to test everything in the default form. We said, look, most people are just going to turn these on and go. So that's how we want to test them without going crazy with the little tweaks. Um, so TorGuard, maybe in part because of that difference in the encryption standard, was almost always the fastest connection anywhere we tested around the world. And we tested at three different times of the week to kind of deal with Netflix traffic jams at different times of day. Um, and they were always, you know, like I said, right near the top. Um, the downside is the apps aren't quite as polished. Uh, the settings are a little easy to get lost to, and some of the support we felt was a little bit outdated if you're going to look through the tutorials. Um, that said, if you want to save a few bucks or if you're really comfortable with all the settings, you know, if you kind of fall more into the power user, um, I think TorGuard will be a really good option. I think uh, one of the... <laughs> Let's just, let's just put it this way. People who are really like seeking out VPN service who feel strong about it are very opinionated and rightfully so. They, they want to protect their privacy. They, you know, they want to feel more secure online. But what that ends up doing if you're if you're on the on the other side thinking, I want to get a VPN, but I don't know what to get. You do searches online. You find all sorts of conflicting information. You know, they might have on their site that, uh, we you know, we don't log or whatever. And then you find a bunch of people saying, well, yeah, we'll check Check this article from four years ago where it was proven that they do log like how how do you as a user how do you approach this so that you know that you can trust the vpn service that you're actually signing up for that it isn't as you point out in the article some dude in his ba- in you know in a basement wearing a dolphin uh, onesie <laughs> the, the, right. the, doll, the, the dolphin onesie, which uh, yeah. was courtesy of uh, Swift on Security, yes, uh, yes, security on Twitter, um, and and I mean we had long conversations about exactly that of um, you know where where can I get where, a dolphin onesie? <laughs> <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with dolphin onesies. I have a lot of friends who wear dolphin onesies <laughs> all the time. <laughs> But anyways, Absolutely. how do you, how what about that level of trust? Like, how do you know that you can trust the VPN service that you're signing up for? So I I think it's uh, it's on everybody to look past the marketing speak right now because a lot of them will have big giant letters that make you feel comfortable, um, but even their privacy policies maybe maybe there's a little bit of connection metadata that's getting stored away for 30 days or 90 right. days. Um, we. This is why we ended up wanting to talk to the leadership and see public leadership listed and accessible to anyone um, from whoever our pick was going to be, because we felt like that's the best proxy right now for an organization you can trust. If you can't find the leadership, if they aren't out there supporting privacy causes, supporting Internet security causes, um, it's just too hard to know. And. Um, one of the things we got into, I, I got some great information from uh, the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, Joseph Jerome over there talked to me a lot about um, exactly this issue of trust and these privacy policies. And the reality is you do have to kind of decide to trust them because there's not a lot of enforcement. Um, most marketing and privacy policy stuff can really only be enforced through the FTC um, for this kind of thing. So. Uh, if there is some article out there that says, oh, they claim no logging, but in reality they do, um, it, it's hard to enforce that. The CDT's brought a complaint against the FTC against one provider, um, and there's you know some word about some other ones that are, that have been out there, um, but you know that that that's not much enforcement there, and and it's there's not many options that you can uh, fall back to, especially when so many people are. Um, antsy to get a provider that's outside the U.S. They see it as a way of right. kind of dodging the the U.S. information uh, dragnet. Um, oh, if I if I have a VPN provider outside of the U.S., it'll it'll make my data more private. Um, but the flip side to that is then you also lose 
pretty much any chance of any sort of enforcement. So if it is somebody untrustworthy running it, um, that's straight up lying about their privacy policy, you really won't have any options. Um, so again, I think the the best thing to do is go back and say, okay, maybe I'm already using the service and maybe I'm already ha happy with it, but who's behind it? And if you can't figure that out, um, you know, that's when I would really say you should investigate other options. Um, and there still is a little bit of trust built in there, even if you know who's behind it. Um, there are security experts out there who will say, uh, I don't care if I know who be who's behind it, I'm still not handing up my data. Um, I, I'm a little bit more liberal than that when it comes to certain cases like public Wi-Fi. I think um, it's a fair trade-off to say, well, the more immediate threat on uh, you know, this airport Wi-Fi or this cafe Wi-Fi, it's, it's worth trusting my VPN provider in this situation, especially when I've done the due diligence. Mm. And I mean, there's always the idea of uh, running your own VPN server to, to route traffic through and taking it into your own hands. I guess that's a, an, opportunity, uh, an option as well. Uh, Mark Smyrniotis from The Wirecutter. Love all the stuff you guys are doing at The Wirecutter, and this is no different. It's a, such oh, a, so a great, exhaustive look at something that people are looking up all the time. It's really hard to know what to trust, and uh, thankfully, everybody trusts The Wirecutter. So we really appreciate the research that you did on this, and thank you for joining us today. Hey, thank you so much for the time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. We'll talk to you soon, Mark. Bye. And finally, we did earlier talk uh, all about, you know, the higher level stuff from Facebook's F8 conference. But one of the things that caught my eye uh, from Facebook's uh, conference was kind of their experimental approach to 3D. We didn't touch on that a little bit earlier, so I thought I'd bring it up now. A few modest announcements. First, Facebook said that they will soon allow you to take pictures using your phone, assuming, I, I think... This would be done with dual lenses. And then it would animate those images in a 3D type of view in the newsfeed. So as you're like scrolling down, I think this video kind of shows it. That's a photo, but based on the information that it has, it kind of, and it's able to analyze it and break it apart and turn it into kind of a, like a three-dimensional image of some sort. It's really cool looking. It's not groundbreaking or earth shattering, but it's really neat. I don't know. Uh, are you not? Are you, you are, seem not impressed. I, I, I mean, it's interesting that you say it's really neat because you're not on Facebook and you haven't been for over a year. But I can recognize that that <laughs> looks cool. Um. Yes, I guess it looks cool. Um. <laughs> I don't know. I just like. I just feel like all of these things are like. Well, it's not worth. Um. You know, the fact that they lied yeah. about what they were. Um. Who they were giving our data to. Yeah, yeah. it's like candy. It's like here, have some candy and go yeah. away. Yeah. Um. Uh, another thing that they showed off though, and this actually. Um. Well, I'll I'll, I'll tell you what I think in a second. But it's it's maybe a little bit cooler here is uh, Facebook showed off something called VR memories, which uh, uses AI algorithms to create a fully 3d space that's modeled around the background of your photos that are uploaded. So basically kind of starts us down this road of recreating environments from our past. And I guess if you're in VR, you could actually navigate. It, it's using these photos of, say, your childhood to recreate your childhood home. Then you could step into VR and get this. It's it's a very kind of like abstract looking representation. It's kind of pointillism art uh, mm -hmm. style or whatever. But you can actually go, based on this demo, from room to room and then see the the photo that made up that kind of recreated 3D space. And I just really like the idea of that. Um, again, not earth shattering, but I like the idea of like going back into our history and our memories and pulling out these things and being able to relive something that was so long ago that when that picture was taken then, never in a million years was that in our minds that we might someday be able to step into that environment again. And apparently they're kind of working on that right now. Oh, yeah, that looks like a horror movie waiting to happen. <laughs> <laughs> it could be Black Mirror episode waiting mm -hmm. to happen. They're working on the new season. You never know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I uh, it's I I feel like I've seen a lot of this stuff before. And again, um, I won't I won't be swayed by you, Facebook. Uh, you you still need to continue apologizing. <laughs> Stop with the fancy stuff. I mean, it's I mean, I'm, I'm still not on Facebook. It doesn't it doesn't get me back there. But what it does make me think is. Uh, is the power of of photos uh, as just a product in general. Google, 
you know, has done a lot of things good and bad over the years. But I think most people would probably agree that even even from a kind of creepy standpoint, aside putting that aside, the Google Photos app is a really awesome thing, right? Like mm -hmm. what you're able to do with it. It was a great way to kind of get, force people into the Google world because the features were so great and it's centered around photos, which we all care so much about, mm -hmm. that people were willing to kind of overlook some of the creepy stuff in order to get access to it. And I kind of get that same feeling um, from what Facebook's showing off here, these little ways that they can kind of use use photos and be like, see, photos are cool. We're doing cool things with them. Is this enough to pull you back mm -hmm. or pull you in or keep you right. here? Well, I mean, you have not actually deleted your Facebook account. Yeah, I haven't. I, I Yeah, it still exists, but um, I think I've logged in like three times in the past year and however many months, five months. I, I don't know why I don't delete it. I probably should. Well, I just, I can't because every time there's just something, it's not like I need to see, you know, pictures of someone's dog or whatever. It's just like, there's some connection that I have yeah. there, whether it's like an app that I haven't, um, you know, figured out, just gone and created a new account that I've used through Facebook or just sort of some community that I am a part of that mm -hmm. um, I, I can't leave and make everyone come with me. Um, and yeah, it's just, I, I can't, I can't quit you, Facebook. <laughs> just can't quit you. Yeah, it's true. Mm -hmm. It's true. Even I quit you and I still can't quit you. <laughs> uh, I quit you like a year and a half ago and I still haven't actually quit you. Tech News Weekly records live every Thursday, 2.30 p.m. Pacific. Uh, you can be part of the show by emailing us at tnw at twit.tv. Send us your selfies. Subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash tnw. Get off Facebook. Just come and just watch our shows. It's so much more enlightening, in my opinion. Also, if you go to Facebook, you we still put our shows up there. So if you're there, you can get that. And if you want to tweet at me, I am at Megan Maroney. And I am on Twitter much more often than I'm on Facebook. <laughs> Although they're probably much of the same, right? No. Like, really? It's very different. Uh, Twitter uh, hasn't gotten caught uh, hasn't using gotten our caught. Da data. They hasn't haven't gotten, gotten caught, caught using our data uh, in in a way and then, you know, not telling us the truth about it right yeah. away. Okay. Well, we'll find out about that news sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm at Jason Howell. Uh, thanks to everyone who helps with the show. Josh for being our technical director. Burke for scrolling words and helping out here in the studio. Jammer B was in here calling. It's basically a party when we start the show and we thank everyone who helps out to set up this party and thank you for watching another episode of Tech News Weekly. We'll see y'all next week. Bye, everybody. <laughs>